Well, good morning, Oak Ridge family. And uh, you've come back for the second of a series that we're taking. It's called The Renewing of the Mind. Already we've discussed the call for a renewed mind and then the context of the renewed mind last week. And today we're going to be talking about the content of the renewed mind. Now, how many would like a little mind renewal today? Hands up. Well, yeah, most all of us. There's a few sleeping, but that's okay. Uh, on Friday, I had a day off. And uh, I don't know what happens on days off, but I kind of lose my mind uh, because I lose my focus. And I had some errands to do, and uh, one of the errands entailed uh, going to Waterdown, a little town nearby, to a specialty store to get a part. And I got there okay, and uh, I bought my part. And then I drove back into Burlington, and I stopped to, to gas up. Then I realized I didn't have a credit card. So back I went to Waterdown, thinking to myself, I really need some mind renewal. <laughs> I've been noticing a few marbles lying around the house here and there, and I'm wondering if they're mine. So I need mind renewal, and many of you do because you've raised your hands. And that's what we're going to talk about today, and specifically, we're going to talk about the content of the renewed mind. And the first thing I want to tell you about the content of a renewed mind, it's not how much you know. It's who you know. That's the first point when it comes to the content of the renewed mind. It's not how much you know. It's who you know. Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them. Even more vital than us knowing the Lord, because sometimes we can forget who we know, is that the Lord knows us. When we come to him in simple faith and we ask him, Lord, save me. Jesus, I trust your blood and your sacrifice to cleanse me from all my sins. And I believe you're the Son of God, and I ask you to come into my heart and save me. When we do that, the Lord counts us as one of his, and we belong to him. And Jesus says, you become one of my sheep, and I know you. Nothing can ever separate you from my love from then on. Because I have covered all your sins by my grace. I've given you eternal life. So the renewed mind, spiritually, is alive because God knows that mind. That mind has turned to the Lord in repentance and faith and belongs to him. It's not how much you know. Reverend John Stott, great Anglican cleric, from England said this, a diligent study of the scriptures and a critical knowledge of them do not afford salvation or even a correct interpretation. It's worth repeating. A diligent study of the scriptures and a critical knowledge of them do not afford salvation or even a correct interpretation. Now, I love a diligent study of the scriptures, and I seek to interpret them, but that does not give me salvation. So I want to share that with you this morning. Many of you already know that, but maybe some of you don't. It's not about how much you know. It's about who you know. And until you come to know Jesus Christ, your mind is darkened and your spirit is dead. And there's no way that in God's eyes you will have a renewed mind. You have to come to this point first of trusting in the Savior. Having done that, the book of Proverbs, chapter 9, verse 10, says this, The knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. The knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. After you've come to Christ, God wants to renew your mind. Do not be... Do not be conformed to this world, but be renewed 
be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That's what it says in Romans chapter 12 and verse 2. And in that verse, we've already pointed out that the renewing is something that is done to you. It's not something that you do yourself as in self-help. In many secular ways, we can renew our interest in a subject and our information gets updated as we go to school, take a, take a course or read a book, listen to a seminar, get information, and uh, we get up to date on a certain subject. A little bit of self-help. That is not how it works spiritually. The Bible asserts this. Spiritual knowing is a supernatural phenomenon from start to last. It requires the energy of the Holy Spirit. It is by the Spirit that I come to know spiritual truth and spiritual reality. There's a little graph or a little chart that illustrates this. This is the process of spiritual knowing. In our second to last hymn, we talked about our Father. And our Father is the great light of the universe. It says in 1 John chapter 1, verse 5, God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. And what John is telling us when he says that God is light, it means he's the origin of all truth. Everything that's absolutely true originated with God, because God is the God of truth. He's light. So the process of spiritual knowing comes from the Father, the Father of truth. And uh, then the Father sends the Son into the world. And here's truth come near to us. It says in Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 1, In the past, God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he's spoken to us by his Son. And Jesus said, I am the way, the what? The truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. And at Oak Ridge Bible Chapel, we affirm that Jesus Christ is the only true Lord and Savior sent from God. There is no other. There is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Can you say amen to that? Amen. It comes through Jesus. So you've got to come to Jesus and receive his life and be known of him. And come to know him. And then your mind starts to get renewed in the truth. It's through an association and a communion with the Lord Jesus Christ by the power of his spirit. And then Jesus leaves his word. He gives us the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit is the teacher, and the Holy Spirit makes the words of Christ known to us. Another supernatural event, the giving of the word of God. And so the third part in this graph is the word of God, an open word. I'm so glad we can open this still in Canada on this day, and read from it. We are free to open the Word of God. It is the words of God to us. My sister worked in Papua New Guinea amongst uh, tribes there, and they didn't have a word for Bible. The word Bible is just a transliteration of biblos, which means book in the Greek. So they didn't have the word for Bible, and so they called their Bible, not not Bible on the outside, it's God talk. God talk. Isn't that great? God talk. And the word of God is God talking to us. He's speaking to us. Through the agency of the revealed word, the living word, which is Jesus Christ, and through the agency of the written word, he comes to us with his truth. And then he comes down to you and me. Now, that's my picture there. But it could be your picture or anybody's picture, you see. And I'm humble enough to believe, you see, that, that, that by God's grace, I too am a recipient of this truth. Are you humble enough to say, well, I'm at the end of that chain? 
That's not pride, that's humility. Because you see, if you put yourself at the top of the chain, you say, I'm the origin of truth. Now, that's pride. You put yourself at the bottom of the chain, that's humility. Because the Bible says, what did you receive? What did you receive that was not given to you? What do you have that you did not receive? Nothing. Everything that we know is derived. All truth emanates from the God of truth. And this is the pathway of knowing. It says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 12, We have re received the Spirit who is from God, that we may understand what God has freely given to us. It's all by the Holy Spirit of God. You know Jesus. Are you listening to the Word? This is the path of spiritual renewal. This is the path of a renewed mind. Now, considering content, there are three ways in which God seeks to renew my mind. And from here on, if you remember all of my sermons, about three or four years ago, I spoke on, on Ephesians. We had a series on Ephesians, and I spoke on this passage. So if you remember everything that I've told you, you have my permission to go to sleep right now. But I'm going to go back over these three words because as much as I've searched through the scriptures, there aren't three better words to describe the nature of the content of a renewed mind. Ephesians chapter 3. Let's go back to it. For those that don't have their Bible, it's up, up on the screen. Ephesians chapter 3. Verse 17 and 18. And it's a prayer. It starts actually in verse 16. He says, I pray that out of his glorious riches, out of God's glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the saints to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. I want to suggest to you that in verse 18, the NIV has taken a little bit of, short, of a shortcut in the Greek, and I think they've kind of missed the essence of it. If I may be so bold as to disagree with the NIV in order to agree with the New American Standard and the King James. I, I trust that's not heretical for you. The idea is this. When he says that you may have power together with the saints to grasp how wide and long and high and deep, that is the knowledge of God. And then he says, and to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge. So you see, it increases the magnitude of knowing God's love because it begins with knowing God's word. And when you know God better and better, you can appreciate his love more. That's the idea of the context. And that's what's brought out in the King James. So it begins, you see, with informing yourself about God talk, about reading his word. This is how we get a renewed mind. And there are three words here in this passage that tell us how to get that renewed mind, how to get a good content in your mind. Number one, dwelling, dwelling, Christ dwelling there. Now, I know that in a spiritual sense, when we belong to the Lord Jesus Christ, we belong to him and he comes to us. And we, we own him and he owns us. And in that sense, we can say, I have Christ. This is not about possessing Christ as your Savior. It's about him dwelling in your heart. And there's a difference there. I do not believe that Every Christian has this experience of Christ dwelling. Let me explain. The word dwelling means being at home. It means being comfortable. It means coming into your, your uh, uh, TV room and sitting down and kicking off your shoes and putting your feet up on the coffee table and saying, well, you got something to eat, Jim? Just relaxing here. Sure. Make yourself comfortable. Now that's about dwelling. 
Now, I'm going to scri- describe a situation where we couldn't dwell very well. And that's when we went on a holiday up to Kenya. Uh, some missionaries up there, Bud and Marie McDougall, invited us to come in 1978 uh, from Zambia up to Kenya for a month-long holiday. We really needed a break. And they were right beside the Indian Ocean. They were right on the beach. We just waited for the day. Finally, we got there, and the place looked beautiful. It was an old building built many years ago, and it had a stone wall, and rising up from the stone wall to a very high peak was a grass thatch roof. It looked gorgeous in its setting, overlooking the Indian Ocean. But there was a problem. And that is it that the snakes in the area loved that grass roof. You love these stories, don't you? (laughs) And whether they were cobras, or whether they were vipers, or whether they were adders or subtractors, or whether they were rock pythons, which they had in the area in abundance, they would go up into the roof and make their home there. Okay, well, that's fine. The only problem is sometimes they drop from the roof. And that was a fairly regular occurrence. And Bud kind of reminded us of that when we went to bed. He says, well, we've, we've given you a mosquito net around your bed because sometimes snakes can drop from the roof. That was very small comfort. We spent a very uncomfortable night any little sound, what was that? You look up thinking there's a big snake about to come on to you. Fortunately, the next day, they prepared a little cottage just beside them for us to live in, and we lived there. And we dwelled there. We didn't dwell that night in their house. <laughs> we weren't comfortable. All right. Now, the point is this. Is Christ comfortable in your, in your mind? Or are there snakes there? Is it uncomfortable for him? You see, because God knows our minds. He reads our minds. Is it comfortable for Christ in your mind? Is Christ at home there? Well, if it's not, you see, the first part of getting a good content to your mind is get the bad content out. Get the bad content out. Dedicate your mind to God first. Dedicate yourself to the Lord. Romans chapter 6 and verse 12. Dedicate the parts of your body to God as instruments of righteousness. If your mind is an instrument of unrighteousness, you can repent. That's why you do not have a closeness to Jesus Christ, dear Christian. You say, Lord, would you cleanse my mind? Would you forgive me? Would you cleanse my mind? And ask the Lord to, to cleanse you of all known sin. Come before him. Humble yourself before him and say, Lord, cleanse my mind. Cleanse my mind. Beware of a couple of pitfalls. Beware of double-mindedness. Because, you see, some of us, we would really like to have a renewed mind and we would like to have good content, but we really do love our sin. We really do love our sin. And so we kind of excuse ourselves. And we carry on some life that's apart from God in in our life as well. We know it's there. It's in our minds. But we do not really desire the Lord to get it out because we love it too much. There was a woman who had a very difficult History, by the way, this is just a generic description, not fitting anyone in particular. A woman had a very bad history of physical and sexual abuse as a child. And in some degree, she had recovered enough to go to school and then to get married and have children. But in the last few years, she had become very promiscuous. And although a believer, she had fallen into promiscuity And many of the thoughts of the abuse had come back into her mind. And when talked to concerning her promiscuity and the possibility that it was sin and she needed to repent of it, 
She said this. She said, Dr. Rennie, if somebody comes into your hospital and they're laying on the hospital bed and they're hurting and they've just been in an accident, would you expect them to behave well and do all that they're supposed to do? I said, no. She said, that's me. I'm a victim. How can I behave well? How, what, what do you expect of me? I'm a victim. Well, you know, for victims, it's okay to, to hurt. It's not okay to sin. It's not okay for victims to sin any, any more than it's okay for regular people to sin. And that is not an excuse. That was double-mindedness in her heart. She was, in, in effect, saying, it's okay that I sin because, you see, I hurt too much. Don't do it. Do not be double-minded. It says in the book of James that you will be an unstable believer if you are double-minded. And also there's a problem of compartmentalizing. That's quite a big word. And men usually know how to do this better than women because they have a single focus more than women, they tell me, psychologically. Women are more multifocused, multitaskers, and men can got, get this single focus idea. So they can compartmentalize their life and they, they, they can be actually perfect Christians at church. And they look great and they talk great. But at home, they go into another compartment I remember one wife who said, well, why don't you just switch it around and be grumpy at church and nice at home for once? <laughs> a man who is sweet as can be at church and he's physically abusing his wife and children at home. That's compartmentalized. Don't do it. Expose all of your mind to God. Expose all of your heart to God. Repent of your sin. The next part is groundedness. The renewed mind requires a foundation of truth. It says that we are to be grounded as well as dwelling, as Christ dwelling in our minds. Grounded and, or established, it says in the NIV. This building that's uh, on the PowerPoint is the Pantheon in Rome. Kathy and I had the privilege of visiting this building a few years ago. And it's just gorgeous. And it looks, it doesn't look its age. Let's put it that way. Some of us do. But this building doesn't. It was built in the first century A.D. And it's still in use. Many buildings built then are gone or else they're in, they're in ruins. The Roman Forum is in ruins. But the Pantheon stands. And it's still a building in use today. It's used sometimes as a church. Sometimes as an oratorio, people go there and they have concerts. It's a beautiful, beautiful building. And at the side of the building, they dig down and they show you the kind of foundations that uphold this building. And they go down and down and down into the soil of Rome until they hit bedrock. It's very deep. And that's why that building is still standing, because it has a firm foundation. The Bible says in in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 20, we are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ being the chief cornerstone. What a deep foundation we have. We have the word of God, the living, breathing words of God to instruct us. We need to build our life on the Lord Jesus Christ and on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Therefore, study the word. He says in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 18, Grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. What are you learning about Jesus that's new? Are you learning anything new, Christian? Are you growing in the knowledge of God? There's a, there's a vast mine of understanding that needs to be tapped if you think you know it all. I talked with a man not too long ago in counseling, and there he's a Christian, and he's in trouble in his life, and as soon as I started to talk to him, he says, I know it all. I know it all. Well, the Bible says if you think you know it all, you know nothing. You haven't begun to know as you ought to know. And he didn't know it all. He needed the understanding of God's word to get him out of the problems of his life. 
We have elective Bible classes that are starting at Oak Ridge. You're going to sign up. You have this desire to get grounded in your life, to know the truth. As Paul Little said in his book many years ago that was a great help to me, know what you believe. Oh, I believe in Jesus, but I don't know anything much more than that. Well, know what you believe. Grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Ignorance of God's truth is a cause of darkness, even in the mind of a Christian. In Ephesians 4, we were reading in Ephesians 3, just over the page, in Ephesians 4, it says this, I tell you this and insist on it, Christians. I insist on it in the Lord, that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do in the futility of their thinking. Can you imagine this? Christians with futile thinking. Futile thinking, darkened minds. Go read the rest of the passage. It's not describing the unsaved. It's describing the state of a Christian with an, uns with an unsanctified mind, with a mind that's not grounded in the truth. So he doesn't think like a Christian. She doesn't think like a Christian. They think like the unsaved. Well, don't let that be the case in you. Garrison your mind with a knowledge of the truth. In seeking to find answers to the problems of life, we need to constantly to ask the question, what does God think? And we go and we search the scriptures to determine what God thinks about this and what God thinks about that. And we find the answer in God's word. He says in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, that in his word he's given us all that we need for life and godliness through the true knowledge of him. It's all there. In order to have a renewed mind, what you need is the Bible. That's what you need. And that's all, it's all there. Now, psychology would seek to tell us what they think. There's lots of armchair psychologists who will tell you what they think about this or that. Or you can tune in to Dr. Phil or any number of people who will tell you what they think about this or that. It's what God thinks. A woman is having premarital sexual relations. She's a Christian. She develops a conscience about it. So she goes to a counselor. And she says, I've, I'm, I'm really convicted about this. What should I do? Well, the counselor says, well, you should probably stop it if you've got a bad conscience, but be careful how you stop it because you might hurt the other person and you might even hurt yourself if you're addicted to something. What you've got to do is wean it off of it gradually. So just starting, start cutting back on your, on your relations. Just start cutting back gradually. Then nobody gets hurt. I thought to myself, if a bank robber and you know where I'm going. If a bank robber had come in to the office and said, well, I've, I've got this problem. I'm robbing banks. And the counselor says, well, just start cutting back. <laughs> no, you don't say that, you see. You say, quit it. Quit it. And God's word says, flee youthful lusts which war against the soul. Quit it. Run from it. Is there going to be emotional fallout? Yes, you can take the fallout by God's grace. Run. Don't be concerned about how you feel or about how the other person feels. Just get out of it. Run. That's what the Bible says. There's a principle of first fruits, and I love this principle, and that is when you give the first of, of anything to God, he blesses the rest. If in your mind you seek the Lord, he will bless the rest of your thinking. How we need to understand this. Whatever you're engaged in, whether it's engineering or whether it's business or whether it's nursing, God will bless the rest of your thinking if you give the first portion to the consideration of the knowledge of God. I experience this, and I humbly submit that... And I've already submitted to this. I wasn't the sharpest pencil in the drawer at, at the medical school. I didn't, well, wasn't in the, the, didn't get the gold medal or anywhere close to it. 
But when I signed up to go to Zambia as a missionary, and I, I asked the Lord to cleanse my mind and prepare me for that mission work, God did two things. First of all, he opened up my mind to many of the scripture principles that I now preach. And it wasn't that I thought them through. They were given to me in a span of about three weeks before I left for the mission field. I was just, God was filling my mind with stuff that I was going to need. And when I got to Zambia and I started learning surgery and I started learning medicine, there was stuff that I shouldn't have known that I did know. One of the missionaries had a, had a heart attack. And I said, well, I, I, I'm going to give him this drug. And he got back to England, and the, the uh, internist there in England said, well, how did, how did he know out in Zambia, how did he know that little missionary doctor out there to give him this drug? And it was the right drug. It was the right drug. And I just thanked the Lord. I said, Lord, thank you. You're giving me wisdom because, first of all, I opened my mind to you, and then you opened my mind to what I need to know. That's the principle of first fruits. Lastly, is rooted, rootedness. Rooted in the truth, as he says in verse 17, rooted and established in love. Kathy and I planted a few plants in the garden. And we're taking special care, giving special treatment to those plants because they need to be rooted. And uh, we put in the quick start and we make sure that it's got all the best uh, nutrient in the soil and, and we're putting extra water on there so that that plant gets rooted. What is rootedness all about? It's all about learning daily nutrition for the plant. That's what rootedness is. It's where it gets its daily sustenance, daily. A daily dependence on Christ for spiritual nourishment is what spiritual rootedness is all about. It's not about going to Bible school or going to the classes on Sunday morning and getting a big input of the Word of God. It's about daily reading something from God's Word because that's your nourishment for the day. That's your nourishment. Is it important to daily read God's Word? I believe it's just as important as having breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And it says, Job says, I have esteemed the words of your mouth more than my necessary food. And Jeremiah says, Thy words were found, and I did eat them, and they were to me the joy and rejoicing of my heart. Every single day, I need to crack the book, and I need to read something. Doesn't it be a lot? How much food do you need for the day? You need to get into God's Word. A daily reading of God's Word is so important. A memorization of God's Word so you can take it with you. Now, some of you take your Bible with you and, you know, you put it on your, on your Palm Pilot or you, you, you put a little cue card on your, on your, uh, uh, your notepad, but that's fine. Why not put it right into your mind? It says in Psalm chapter uh, 119 and verse 11, I have hidden your word in my heart so that I might not sin against you. When the word is in your mind, it can instruct you in your mind. You don't have to go and read it again. It's, it instructs you in your mind. And that's why it's important to memorize God's word. Some people think I've memorized a whole lot of God's Word. No, I haven't. I'm not that great a memorizer. I've just memorized key passages. And I, I try. It's, it's harder. Now that I'm into my 40s, it's, it's harder for me to... I know, I lie a bit, but there you go. It's harder for me to, to memorize, but keep putting little verses into your mind. It'll bless you. It'll increase the content of your mind. You'll be more rooted when you do that. Keep a song in your heart. I tell you, Christian songs are powerful. And down through the ages, Christians who didn't know how to read, they, they learned good theology through good hymnology. 
That's why our hymns are important. And remember them and sing them. Sing them in, the, in, the, in your the quiet times. Sing, sing them when you're in the car. Even if the guy next door in the car thinks you're crazy, just keep singing. And you're, you're repeating to yourself the, the great words of hymnology. That's how to maintain rootedness. Meditation. What is meditation? Well, it just means you're thinking, thinking hard about something. You're ruminating. You're turning it around and you're thinking and looking at it from different sides and you're admiring it and you're thinking, what does that mean and what does that nuance mean? That's meditation. Now, in Buddhist kinds of meditation, transcendental meditation, they say, empty your mind. Do not do that. The meditation that is that is going to produce rootedness in the scripture in, in a scripture way and in a Christian way is to focus your mind on the Lord. It says in Psalm 119, verse 15, I will meditate on all your precepts. Don't meditate on nothing. Meditate on the Lord. Think about him. Think about his ways. Think about his truth. Ask yourself, what does that mean? And pray for enlightenment. Take that into your mind and, and think about it. That's meditating. I tell you, meditating changes your brain waves. It gives you peaceful brain waves. If you're struggling from anxiety, learn meditation. Except learn spiritual meditation. Don't go to some guru. Go to the Lord. Put some verses into your mind and meditate on them. It'll take your blood pressure down. It'll calm your spirit. It'll change the physiology of your of your your body when you practice good meditation. And then this is the other way to practice rootedness. You take it in and it goes out. If you just keep taking in and taking in, you get fat and you get diseased. There's a lot of spiritually fat Christians. If all they do is take in and they don't share and let it come out, so the way to practice rootedness is to take in and then give out. Learn something in the morning, share it with somebody in the afternoon. Share the word of God. Let it go out of your mouth. And the Lord will keep you rooted in him. Use it or lose it. Whatever you use, you will remember. Whatever you use will become more and more precious to you. And you will be rooted in the truth. We're going to go into communion, and uh, I was thinking the other day about the mind of Christ. We've been thinking about our own minds. Christ was quite a unique person. He was the most unique person who ever lived because he was both human and divine. He was the God-man. And you kind of wonder, what's going on in the mind of somebody as unique as that? If we were free to have some sanctified imagination... Can you imagine knowing the thoughts of other people? Wouldn't that blow your mind? There was a movie about that. Somebody who knew the thoughts of other people. In fact, he, he knew the thoughts of women, so he was able to get advantage over women because he knew their thoughts. Well, that's just Hollywood. But you see, the Lord knew the thoughts of men and women. He knew it was in their hearts. He knew it was in their minds. Can you imagine that? A, that's a busy mind. And yet he was still gracious and loving to them. Can you imagine the thoughts he would have as he was walking along the desert paths of, of Judea and tired and, and foot sore and he knew about helicopters? Could, could, maybe the Lord thought, boy, I should sure appreciate a helicopter at this point. Or at least a good pair of shoes. But there he let... He, he, walked with the sandals of the day and he walked and he walked and he walked he knew better but he he knew what he could do but he limited himself to those paths and i can remember i can imagine that once in a while he thought boy i'd sure like to talk to peter at this time and he's away in the village a cell phone would sure come in handy Maybe, maybe not, but he knew about cell phones. What was on the Lord's mind? 
Well, there's some verses that tell us what was really on the Lord's mind. We don't have to imagine these things. First of all, heaven was on his mind. He was constantly directed to heaven. He was always going up to the Father. He was always thinking about things on earth from the perspective of heaven. And when the disciples came to him and said, Lord, teach us to pray, he said, now you, you, you say this, our Father in what? In heaven. 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 Heavenly minded. The Lord was earthly minded in the sense that he attended to things on earth, but he was first heavenly minded because that's where he came from. He was holiness minded. He was holiness minded. He says, I always do those things which please my heavenly father. And when he saw the sins of others, he was grieved in his spirit. Why? Because the Holy Son of God was in the midst of sinners. Can you imagine the anguish of his heart? He was the man of sorrows and acquainted with grief because he was, he was a holy man and he was in the midst of sinners and he saw the sin and he saw the effects of them and that's why he was the man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. He put himself into that terrible milieu for you and me. But he wasn't just a sad man. I believe Jesus was the happiest man who ever lived. He had a happy mind. He had joy. He could say, the lines have fallen unto me in pleasant places. My inheritance is delightful. And he joyed in his God. It says in, in, in Psalm 45, in verse 8, he was anointed with the oil of joy beyond all of his fellow men. Most happy man on earth was the Lord Jesus Christ. A lot of people think that he was just long face. I'll tell you, a man with a long face would not have the children running to him and jumping into his arms. He was a joyful man. He spoke with joy. He had a joyful mind, happy mind. He had a helping mind. He had a mind to help others. And one day he got up and he said, we're going to that village of Nain. I know it's a long walk, guys, but we're going to go to Nain. And so he went to Nain just in time to meet a funeral procession coming out of the town. A young man had died, left a mother, and she was a widow, and this was her only child. And Jesus knew the heartache of that mother, and so he went there to stop the procession, to say to the man, arise, to give that man back to his widowed mother. Did the Lord have a good heart? I tell you, he had a great heart. Loving, helping heart. He had a hopeful mind. It says in Psalm 16, this is a quote of the, the mind of Christ. He says, I saw the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I shall not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad. My tongue rejoices. My body also will live in hope because you will not abandon one to the grave. The Lord Jesus lived in hope all of his life why he didn't get depressed. The cure for depression is good hope. Good hope. He had cause to be depressed. He didn't get depressed because his mind was garrisoned with sure hope. Then lastly, what was on his mind was you and me, his own, his own people. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the full extent of his love, John 13, verse 1. And that's when he took them to the upper room and he shared with them the truths concerning his, his leaving them and going to the Father and the Spirit's coming. He shared with them the truth concerning him being poured out as, as an offering for sin and being given into the hands of sinners and into the hands of the Gentiles so that he would be crucified and then risen on the third day. Why? Because of you and me. He wanted to save us. He didn't have to do that for himself. He was holy. He, he gave himself the holy one who knew no sin became sin for us. He did it for you and me. And that's why we, we take this remembrance feast. Let's just pray and give thanks for it and meditate on the mind of Christ, this mind that was for you. Father, we thank you for your mind. We thank you that you, were, you, you gave Jesus 
the fullness of all of your life, that he was the son of God, son of man, and that uh, his mind was holy, his mind was heavenly, his mind was filled with helping, his mind was full of hope, happiness, his mind was for his people. I pray, Lord, that you would, as we take this cup and we take this bread, you would bless it as we pass it from one to another. We may remember the one who so loved us unto death and desire to call us his own. Help us, Lord, to receive it with joy and to bless your name and worship you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Content of a renewed mind. And your word tells us, let the word of Christ richly dwell within you. Lord, for those who belong to you, for those of us who know you as our Savior, and desire for you to be our Lord. We pray, Father, that you would help us to seek your word. And may the Holy Spirit do a work of grace in us to transform our minds, that it will be a renewed mind, a place where Christ can dwell, a place grounded, a place rooted in your word. May you bless our minds. Will you bless, may you bless each and every heart today. Father, you know our soul's needs. You know what needs to be done in us. We pray that you'd give us, Lord, a heart of repentance, a heart of faith. We pray, Father, that uh, you would bring us to obedience. Commend ourselves to your care for this day. Bless us in all our journeys and all our times. We commend ourselves to you in Jesus' name. Amen.